Shabbat Shalom. I love Purim. Love Purim. And we had an amazing Purim this past week with many thanks to Linda Katzman, to Rhoda Katzman, and to the Sydney Katzman Memorial Purim Fund. This place was hopping. There were actually no parking spots left from what I understand. You know, amazing. What a wonderful celebration. And of course, at the heart of the Purim celebration is the idea of getting dressed up in costume. So you missed our Chazen Kenobi over here, Chazen Obi-Wan Kenobi. You know, it was Return of the Judai was the theme. So we did, we did Star Wars. And Rabbi Skywalker is standing in front of you. I brought a few other costumes because I, I love Purim so much that over the course of the 24 hours, depending on the various groups that I meet with, the little kids, the Purim celebration, whatever it is, I'll break out different costumes from Purim's past. So we'll see if any of these costumes tell you anything about me. <laughs> By the way, this is really what I look like under my suit, just so you know, it's not a costume. Can you tell what this is? Sergeant Pepper. A few years back we did Sergeant Pepper. And of course, last but certainly not least, you like that? I'm a natural blonde. When I used to have hair. This holiday of Purim, of course, is filled with celebration, it's filled with joy, and it's filled with dressing up. One of the central customs is dressing up. Now, why we dress up is not entirely clear. There are lots of explanations. Perhaps it was because Esther, in order to become queen and thus save the Jewish people, had to get all dressed up for the pageant and had to look her very best. Perhaps it's because at the end of the story, Mordechai comes to get dressed up in the king's clothing. Perhaps it comes to symbolize the idea that God is hidden, dressed up, if you will, hidden throughout the story of the Megillah, and we have to look quite specifically for God's presence there in the biblical story. But nevertheless, this custom of dressing up is quite ancient. And so it was with great sadness that I saw that, again, throughout Belgium, these Jewish communities were encouraging Jews, their fellow Jews, to not get dressed up. And we can all understand in the midst of their terrorist crisis, they weren't saying don't celebrate Purim. They were saying if you get dressed up and put a mask on, we won't be able to tell a difference between the good guys and the bad guys, between our own and those who might be seeking to attack us. What a tragedy that was. I, my heart broke for our brothers and sisters across the Atlantic, and we even in the midst of our Purim celebration said that we are celebrating Purim for them because they were really unable to do so in so many ways. And so it was this idea of masks and costumes has been on my mind for the last week. What does a mask do? In some ways a, masks, a mask covers us up. You can't see the real us when you're wearing a mask, when you're wearing a costume. In other ways, a mask or a costume allows our true self to come forward. Because we're not as concerned, maybe people won't realize who we really are, we're allowed to be the person we actually want to be. So sometimes a mask and a costume can cover up. And sometimes a mask and a costume can allow the true self to shine forth. As I mentioned just a couple weeks ago, the Chazan and I and nearly 50 others from Shar Tzedek were at APAC, the APAC Policy Conference, joining 18,000 people, Jews and Gentiles, Americans of every race and ethnicity and background, standing up for the state of Israel. And it's hard when you're in that sort of environment with all the energy that it creates to begin to discern truth. What is the mask and what is really behind that mask? So, of course, everybody who was in favor of 
the Iran deal this past summer, which was at last year's APAC convention the major conversation piece, the Iran deal, whether it was good or bad. Everyone who was for it, including Vice President Joe Biden, came up to tell us how amazing the deal was and how it's pushed back Iran's ability to achieve nuclear weapons status and how it's actually saving the world in a lot of ways because Iran's nuclear capabilities have been so limited. Then there are opponents of the Iran deal who come to say, look, Iran now has $150 billion or so in order to fund terrorism. Yes, okay, we've delayed the nuclear weapon for now, but the moment the deal is over, they've got the nuclear bomb. What has it really achieved? So in the midst of this preparation for our masks and our costumes, it's hard to know what's truth and what is a disguise. Similarly, we saw all of the major presidential candidates, I should say most of the major presidential candidates. We had the privilege of, in addition to Vice President Biden, seeing Hillary Clinton, we saw Donald Trump, we saw John Kasich, and we saw Ted Cruz. And I want to give thanks, Alan Schwartz is right here. He camped out so that I could have the best seats in the house to stand quite literally 10 rows from these people. All of them said wonderful things about Israel. All of them said how much they're going to do for the state of Israel. And the crowd cheered. No surprise. Now several of them, well, let's do it differently. One of them said on his very first day in office, he's going to tear up the Iran deal. That same person said on his very first day in office, he's going to move the American embassy to Jerusalem. That same person said on the very first day of office, he's also going to tear up Obamacare. He's going to have a very busy first day in office. <laughs> What's the truth? What's hyperbole? What's entire fiction? And it's up to uh, each of us to really try to discern through their words to see the true man, the true woman behind what it is they're saying. Many of you know there was quite a controversy about Donald Trump as what I heard was a hundred or so, many of whom were rabbis, some non-rabbis, walked out while Trump spoke. They were upset about somebody who they call, in their words, borders on Hitler in what he said, their words. There are others, uh, actually they threw one man out who tried to protest and he's now getting all sorts of press in the Times of Israel, a rabbi who got thrown out. That's how passionately they feel about this man. And to watch the crowd respond to Donald Trump was amazing. The power and sway he had and has over people the power to persuade. But frankly, it's true in so many ways of all of these candidates. There's a certain electricity they possess, a certain ability to sway the masses, a certain ability to tell us exactly what we want to hear so that we stand up and cheer. But it's up to each of us to discern the truth. It's up to each of us to discern the man or the woman behind that mask of the presidential candidate to know who's telling the truth, who will be the best for our country, who will care for Israel, who will make this world a safer place, a better place for everyone. Everyone. Now speaking of masks and speaking of costumes, a lot of the APAC conversation has to do with the war on terror. It has to do with the Iran situation. It has to do with Israel's very security and some of the risks and threats against Israel. But at the same time, in a way that AIPAC does so beautifully, it couples that with the non-military side of Israel, the technology, the innovation, the way Israel stands up for all of its citizens, Jew and Muslim, Christian, and trying to care for those who are in need. There was one moment where all of us were watching a big screen about what, what's happening in a certain region of Israel and how they're taking care of, of people with disabilities through music. How they're using music to 
really inspire and uplift these, these young children. And so we're watching this screen, and, you know, it's wonderful, and it's heart moving, and all of a sudden we hear a young girl sing, there's a place for us, somewhere for us. And then the lights come up, and the girl's not just in the video. She's there on the stage in front of us. I'm telling you, there was not a dry eye among 18,000 people. Because not only was there a place for children with disabilities, but in so many ways, that's how I feel about the state of Israel. There's a place for us. Somewhere for us. Now, what's the real Israel? Is it the military state, or is it the technological and innovative nation that cares for those in need? Obviously, it's some of both. As we look at the presidential candidates, what they say and what they actually are, obviously, it's some of both. As we look at the Iran deal, is it good or is it bad? Obviously, it's some of both. The masks and the costumes sometimes cover up, the masks and the costumes sometimes bring out the truth. And I couldn't help but think about all of these people responding to Trump, responding to Cruz, responding to Clinton, responding to Kasich, responding to Vice President Biden, responding to the very thing that is APAC, standing up for the state of Israel no matter who is in office, Democrat or Republican, left wing or right wing. And so much of that comes down to the question of, do you believe that Israel is really at risk? Those who don't, those who simply see the innovation and the technology say, here's a 21st century country that doesn't need to worry quite as much as we're talking about. There are others of us perhaps survivors, perhaps children or grandchildren of survivors, who see Israel is at permanent risk. There continues to be an existential threat against the very existence of the state of Israel. And so we stand up, and we do everything in our power to protect Israel, left-wing, right-wing, Republican, or Democrat. But at the end of the day, as we come to remember what Purim stands for. And at the heart of the word Esther, the heroine of the Purim story, is the word seter, secret. God works in secret ways. God is as if behind a mask, cloaked behind a costume. And it's up to each of us to seek the presence of God in our lives and to act on that presence. And it's up to each of us to realize that maybe God is waiting for us to take off our masks and take off our costumes and to stand up for what is right and what is true and to bring our fullest selves to care for Israel, to care for the Jewish people. Because God is never mentioned once in the book of Esther. Rather, Esther stood up, Mordechai stood up, and they cared and protected the Jewish people. Like the story of Purim, like the story of the early Zionists, we know God is there working, but we don't simply stand around waiting for him to do his part. We step forward to do ours. This Shabbat in which we follow the APAC Policy Conference, this Shabbat in which we follow the great holiday of Purim, let us seek to discern truth behind the mask and the costumes. Let us remember that God works in mysterious ways, but God is always working around us. And let us remember that like Esther and like Mordechai and like the early Zionists and like all of those working on behalf of the state of Israel today, we have to step forward to do our part for a strong Israel, for a peaceful world, and to care for all those who are in need. Can you hear so and may this be God's will? And let us say together, Amen. Shabbat Shalom.